Well, it's an honor to be here and present to you all today right here, but also on the web. And I know the camera is tracking me, so I'm going to move over here a little bit just to change the slides. Open space, uh, I'm going to talk about that and how this is a new initiative supported by NASA. It's a five-year program. But I also want to talk about what that's showing. So it's really about seeing the universe insofar as how we chart it and what we really see, but also how it works. And that gets into dynamics, both in observation and simulation. Starting off, I'm just going to show a little bit of this initial film that we did. We're stretching back now about a decade ago, working with Linshipping University in Sweden, where Alex has just gotten his PhD and is our codemaster for open space. We developed something called the digital universe. The digital universe at uh, the American Museum of Natural History was part of the rebuild, a millennium rebuild of the Hayden Planetarium, which was built in 1935 and shows stars on the ceiling. What we were wanting to do was to look at what a planetarium could be in the 21st century and to really look at what you could do with data visualization, especially with the flood of data that's coming in, especially by computer-controlled machines, telescopes, the analysis, data reduction, and the ability to display it in visualization techniques. So this just emphasizes that everything you're about to see in this video, and I'm not going to play the whole thing, but some of you may have seen it online. We've had about 15 million views of this. Uh, this was done originally as a project with the Himalayan Art Museum, the Rubin Museum on 17th Street. I didn't think we were going to have audio, but it's HDMI, so I'm going to... Alex, how do I turn that down a little bit? If possible. Maybe not. We're starting off with looking at the Earth similar to like Google Earth. We all understand this notion of globe browsing. So we're looking at the data, satellite pictures brought together into the context of space. Seeing our planet, but in the context of what it's surrounded by. So the atmosphere is accurately portrayed. It's paper thin. And uh, the NASA data that's collected this is a mosaic of images together. But now we see the satellites, low Earth orbiting satellites, several hundred kilometers, a few hundred miles off the surface of Earth. And then surrounding farther out, we have satellites of GPS. And then we farther out, we see a line. And that line will resolve in a second to the geosynchronous band, some 30,000 kilometers, about 22,000 miles, thank you, um, out beyond the Earth. So at that altitude, over the equator, you rotate around the Earth in 24 hours. And so as the Earth rotates, you're stationary. That's the moon, just over a second in light travel time. And then the sun, about eight minutes away. So the concept of this, when we rebuilt the Hayden Planetarium, was to really bring together these different data sets, a working solar system, and in other words, the planets go around the sun and all those you can set for time. But then put this into context of the stars. So here we are pulling out and we see the Milky Way. We bring up the zodiacal constellations that align with the plane of the solar system that the major planets are aligned to. So we see Scorpius and Sagittarius and we pull away and now we treat the sun in the same brightness that we're treating the stellar database. So all these stars are real places, real distances. And that's the radio sphere. That's how far our radio waves have reached in just 75 years of broadcast history. The galaxy itself is about 100,000 light years across, and we're about halfway out. Magellanic clouds and on out into the charted galaxies that surround us. Different data sets brought together. This data set of 30,000 galaxies is then augmented by a data set of about uh, nearly about 700,000 galaxies. Uh, another data set, uh, about 200,000. It's all together in the data set, about 2 million galaxies. And that's just a small percentage of the total galaxies that we could potentially see in the universe if you look at the Hubble Deep Field, um, which is about 10,000 galaxies in a part of sky that we saw no galaxies from Earth-based. And if you look out far enough, you're looking far enough back in time to the containment of the microwave background, the beginning of the universe, just seen from our perspective. 
And it's not unique to our perspective. Wherever you moved in the universe, you would see that surrounding us. So this is the observed universe. So this is sort of the layout, if you will. And to see the layout of the universe really implies that you makes you wonder how it got here. And so that's the process. So the idea of having something open, open source, and free, that first software you saw plotting the data of the digital universe became a company. And um, so what we're doing is we're trying to take the idea of open source and put this together in plotting space and visualizing both missions, in this case the Pluto mission that we did during the actual encounter. And we show just a few clips here of how this was handled as a network broadcast to 12 centers around the world. Our friend Fran Bagenall is part of a team member. Uh, Michael Marcinkowski sitting right next to her on our left, and he was the one who put this together. Our friend Mark Rigby in Brisbane. So while it was breakfast with Pluto at AM and H, it was lunch with Pluto in Europe and uh, dinner with Pluto in the Far East. And here we see actually in a post-case reconstruction of, the, uh, of Pluto once the images came back. We took what we were doing with the navigation files from NASA, putting that together with the images returned in the case of New Horizons, and we worked with the European Space Agency and their mission to Comet 67P, Cheryamov um to look in detail at this. We're trying to show not just what we saw, but how we saw it. Applying that and those techniques here to a, just a bit of a working proof, the launch site, this is data given to us by the team, and it was curious to them that it looks like it's launching off the coast of Florida. That's an error. This is the type of thing we work with and have to correct. But here you see as a ro any rocket goes up, gets above the atmosphere and quickly goes sort of into orbit and then launches off here to its target, asteroid Bennu. And Bennu will get there, I'm, I believe, in uh, about three years. And, um, but also we're looking at uh, plotting not just missions, but also looking at the Earth and across time to see the dynamics. Here we see the flashing of the clouds on a daily basis but against um, sea surface temperatures. If we look at every 10 minutes, this is new and experimental, but every 10 minutes, that's from the Himawari 8 satellite from Japan. Here we see uh, the uh, fisheye presentation, emphasizing that we do this in the dome, but we can do this on flat screens, we can do it on personal screens, that it's open and networkable uh, as software, this open space. And in this case, we're looking at multiple scale height maps on Mars. These little mountains that you are seeing are about 100 meters across. And this is the current work. This is Michael Solstrom, uh, my current student, along with Ricard. Uh, they, they, they're working on the surface models that are actually returned from the rover. And so we can go from the global map of Mars all down, levels of detail, getting down to the surface. And then I worked with several high school students. Kiara is just off um, to my uh, left there. She led this team of high school, uh, mostly young ladies, actually recreating the microimagery of Mars and uh, creating a full catalog of what the scientists had no time to really reduce. Here we're also working with NASA Goddard's um, community climate, or community, <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, it's a space weather modeling group. Uh, what is it, CCMC? The, the Community Coordinated Modeling Center. Thank you, Alex and uh, for space weather. What we're seeing is density, and so you're actually seeing, this is a bit of, this was prepared by Alex uh, for uh, VIZ-15, um, IEEE conference, but it shows this idea that we want to bring observations and simulation together to look at the dynamics of what's actually seen and to see what the scientists do by skinning that together with simulation to actually look across time and look at these dynamics. And so in this case, we're seeing imagery from several different satellites and their positions, and uh, that this was a rough sketch, so we're not actually seeing it all fully dynamically there. But in this case, we see a time series export uh, from some early work. This was uh, code that actually contributed to the beginning of open space in that case. And to just emphasize our partners here and what, what this is, um, open space we applied to NASA for funding. We got a five-year um, grant. Um, and uh, so we're about a year and a half through our, uh, our, our grant process. But it's really about, as I mentioned, 
looking at um, dynamics and looking at the process of the universe. And um, our university partners are NYU, which is where Alex is doing his postdoc right now, and uh, also the University of Utah, the, um, the Scientific Computing and Imaging Institute, which is one of the largest data visualization groups in the world, and um, also uh, Linshipping University in Sweden, of course, which is where this work really began. And um, we have a number of partners of major planetariums and institutions around the country. Uh, and we can network uh, this together. I'll mention that in just a, in just a minute. Linshipping University and AMNH, we started collaborating in 2002. Anders Inerman, uh, the um, professor there, uh, who's leading this program of advanced computer graphics and data visualization innovation in this, uh, really to push what we can do with data visualization and look at things dynamically. And um, so here's home base at 81st Street. That's the spaceship. It kind of, I wasn't sure whether it was going to look like great architecture when they rebuilt it or something on the New Jersey Turnpike. But, uh, uh <laughs> but nevertheless, inside that sphere is the Hayden Theater. And just to give you a sense of what that looks like, uh, this is me and one of our video engineers, Paul. And I'm uh, pointing out the landing site of Apollo 15 uh, that landed there in August of 1971. And that little rill is actually where lava float. It's about a mile across. It's about the width of the Hudson River, which is just outside here. And, um, and then also emphasizing that this work, this is, this is not fully inclusive of all, all the students' faces, but it gives you an idea of the youth and talent that's uh, coming into this um, from students who have been based down at NASA Goddard, students who have been based at the American Museum of Natural History, and students who have been based at Linshipping University in Sweden. Um, and uh, just looking at some of the space weather, and two of the students here, we're looking at uh, this projected on our IMAX screen, or large format screen, um, at AM and H. And then when they were doing their thesis defense here in the dome at Linshipping University in Norshipping, Sweden. Networking, this software is meant to be networked so that as we create these complicated visualizations, we need to network in expert ability to describe what's going on and uh, also the ability to do things remotely for educational purpose. And here I worked with, for about 10 years, uh, high school in Siem Reap in, uh, in Cambodia. Uh, I was inspired that uh, Angkor Wat, when I visited there, was a model of the universe. And I thought, well, we have one of those in New York. So I was back a few months later with a couple computers. And um, here we see the students actually controlling the Hayden Planetarium from the Siem Reap High School in Cambodia. Figured if we could do that anywhere, we can do that uh, multiple places. Uh, in this case, Dr. Jacob Ashong built the first uh, digital planetarium in sub Saharan Africa in Accra, Ghana, and uh, from his personal retirement funds. And he built this lovely little planetarium. And inside, this is opening day, a donation by um, Dave Weinrich, who's pictured in the middle there, um, with a projector, a Minolta projector um, from Baton Rouge uh, Planetarium, and, and uh, that they donated this. And on this opening day, from the Lower East Side, uh, from a cafe, I was able to do four hours of tours of the universe networked to them. So we're employing that with open space so that we can really, again, bring the experts' view into this. Once again, flying over this data, I'll just emphasize that what we're seeing here is a result from, we're looking at results from several cameras. The background is six meter uh, imagery data, but up close, that's 25 centimeter resolution. So that's about the size of a football. And um, those hills are about uh, 100 meters across. Uh, and also the weathered pattern, it looks like wood. These are layered deposits which have been eaten away by the winds. And this is in one of the largest canyons. Um, this is still sort of a working proof. We don't have the atmosphere of Mars in there yet. Uh, that's uh, something we're still working on. Um, but our ability to fly over this live, this is sort of flown over in the dome and recorded. Um, so this experiential aspect of bringing our exploration of space to all of us across the world and also having it open so that you yourselves can be able to go into the code, make additions, 
and share it with the rest of us. Last thing, Alex, I think I'm going to hand it over to you here because this, I think you have some similar material. So thank you. I'm going to hand it over to Alex now. Okay. Thank you, Carter. So, yes, as Carter mentioned, I'm the lead developer on, on Open Space, and uh, the, all of the students that you saw, and about double the amount that we have now, uh, I'm basically the person who's hurting them and getting, trying to squeeze a bit of code out of the students that is hopefully reusable for the general public. So, after this introduction, I thought I would go into a bit of the technical details that might be interesting for, uh, for the viewers and for everyone here, hopefully in form of questions afterwards. So, as Carter mentioned, open space is large scale. It's about contextualization of the data. It's about displaying multi-model data. And, well, it's astrovisualization. That's why we're here, right? <coughs> and from my point of view, from the, from the research standpoint, uh, I see open space as a platform for three different avenues. Uh, once, we want to display data to the public. So we want to do public dissemination to, of any kind of data. So, um, if you have any data that you want to present in, a, in, in an immersive environment, such as a planetarium or VR headsets or flat screens, then hopefully we can provide the means to do that relatively easy. I'm not magnetic, I'm promising. Uh, then the second one is a research platform. I mean, as I'm doing my postdoc right now, I'm interested in doing uh, scientific visualization research. And my plan is to use open space for that. And as I'm going to show a bit later, we have already done that, and we're continuing to doing that as well. And lastly, with collaboration with the CCMC and NASA Goddard, they want to use it as a science tool. So they want to put in their data and perform their actual science on or within open space and also display it. So that's the three prongs that we've been uh, working on in parallel. So you've seen all of the five partners that we have. So let's go into the details. So uh, it has started technically in the end of December 2013, but it was two days before New Year's, so I'm rounding that up to 2014. And the main goal is and was to put it out as open source. So it's, well, as it's on GitHub under the MIT license, so everyone's free to use it, make money out of it, as long as you slap our name on it, we're fine with that. And there's the URL that you can uh, get it from. So as Carter mentioned, since 2016, since the beginning, we're funded through the Science Mission Directorate, the uh, Cooperative Agreement Notice. And we, so, we've, so far, we have uh, two full-time developers that are now working on that for a bit over a year now. And you can see where that has kicked in, in the graph beneath. As, a, uh, as Carter was saying, so I did my PhD in Shipping University, and we have a, our own little dome which is in a science institution. So there are a lot of people from the streets walking in, but also a lot of uh, schools visit that science center, and they want to be exposed to, well, science, science, I guess. Uh, so they, they, want to, they want to know how visualization is working and how it is impacting us and how we, well, how we make use of that science in order to uh, educate the public. So that's my background to why I'm getting interested in especially the public dissemination part, because that's how I got academically brought up, so to speak. Uh, so I'm going to go through some of the same, same things with a slightly different viewpoint again. As you've seen with the uh, space weather, I want to just show one quick video of a coronal mass ejection. Probably most of you have seen that. It's basically well, very, very, very simplified, huge explosions on the sun that produce plasma and throw it into the solar system. And one of the, the videos that you saw was a simulation of the traversal of this uh, coronal mass ejection. So as you can see, these are huge. It's, as it says, the right, the right image is massively, massively not to scale. So they are very, very beautiful if these CMEs hit Earth because they can produce northern lights and it looks really pretty but they can also be pretty dangerous. So this is a, from a Lloyd's investigation, the insurer. They estimated that if one of the biggest CMEs would hit Earth today, we would be looking at between half and 2.6 trillion US dollars in North America in damages. And 
most of that damage, most of the damages would come from uh, transformers that would burn out, and it would take about 10 years worldwide to replace all of those transformers. So if such a thing happens, and we don't predict it, then we would be looking at areas of the Earth be out of power for 10 years, which is quite an important thing to predict. Because if we predict it correctly, we shut down everything, let it pass through Earth, turn everything up again, and nothing, nothing happens except some people had, didn't have warm water for a couple of hours. So that's why this is, from a, from a research standpoint, a very, very high gain uh, endeavor. So this is the video that you saw before. And this is the, a 3D rendering of, uh, um, of the solar wind. So this is now done in, in open space. And it basically shows the, the time varying volumetric data that we can deal with. So this, this simulation is the two weeks around the Pluto flyby. And it's, uh, I forgot the size exactly, but it's a couple of hundred gigabytes that we have to shuffle to the GPU. So it's, I mean, technically very, very challenging as well. Uh, just to dive into that technical part a bit, it's basically using a level of detail algorithm to figure out, okay, these parts of the volume we are interested in, so we need them at higher resolution. If it's farther away, we can get away with lower resolution, so we don't need to access all of the data at once. And there are papers about that. So just a very, very quick uh, overview of the New Horizons mission. Um, as everyone probably knows, we flew by Pluto. And basically what that meant is we got from this image from Hubble, which was the best image that we had ever of Pluto. So it's like amazingly 13 pixels across. So through the time, we slowly developed this single image into what we have now, thanks to well the flyby and actually being close to it. So the question was, we have this nice image, and all of those images were produced on the, on the web in massive <laughs> amounts, but no one really understands how those pictures were taken. Because that's, if you see like the, the huge heart on Pluto, that's not a single picture that was taken. There was actually, I think, 16 pictures that were slightly overlapping, and someone had to go in and manually correct those images so that, they're, that, they're, uh, that the exposure is correct, and then add color information from an entirely different instrument on top of that. So what we wanted to show with New Horizons was the process from the images taken on the spacecraft to we have a final image at the end. So this is uh, the image that you're seeing here is uh, one intermediate step of that. Um, this picture I took before the flyby, since we don't have the images, so we only show uh, green rectangles. And each green rectangle is one image that New Horizons Okay, this is difficult for me as a non-English speaker. Would have, will have taken. So by the time I took this picture, it, this was a, in the, a plan for the future of the New Horizons spacecraft. So by now we have all of these images that were taken. And a couple of more words for the uh, um, network event. So as Carter was saying, we have um, since this event done a few networked events where we collected multiple sites, but since today, the Pluto event well, is the, the biggest such event that we had. So we had in total the four, 14 uh, planetariums that were connected around the world. They were all running open space on their own local machines, and they were connected to one central server that was distributing the connections, or distributing the commands that were given by the student, Michal. And so here we have a list of all of the students, uh, sorry, list of all of the uh, planetariums, and well, also, of course, we put it on YouTube, which you can find by going to the breakfast at Pluto uh, or just searching for that. And yes, I mean, I think everyone can understand the technical challenges of connecting hardware infrastructure like the Hayden or the, the theater in, at the museum on the one hand and the planetarium in Ghana on the other hand, both from a, from a hardware kind of view, point of view as well as from a network point of view. This, one big challenge that we had to deal with is just cutting down the amount of data that we have to transfer, because we, ha we had estimated that we have maybe a reliable 10 to 50 kilobytes a second that we can ship to Ghana. And I mean, video stream is completely off the charge for, charge for that. So, well, but it, since it worked, I think we did a, um, 
Good job. Here's what we saw in our planetarium in Noshopping. So we have a uh, Google Hangout on the left side, and we have open space on the right hand side. Here you see again the green little squares of the images that were being taken at that moment when we were showing that. So we planned the event such that during the event was the closest flyby of New Horizons at Pluto. So it was around 12 in Europe. So that was quite convenient. So we started at 11, we ended at 1, and exactly in the half time we had the closest flyby and we had Orkan who was at the moment speaking and he freaked out positively. So we had Rosetta, and I don't have much more to add to that <coughs> other than projecting images onto a spherical body is decently easy. Doing that with 67P is not so easy anymore because you don't have a really nice concave object that to work with. So uh, a lot of the research um, done by uh, Anton Abrink, uh, another student, um, so he was doing his master thesis on projecting images onto a comet. This is the, the trajectory of uh, Rosetta as it approached the comet. And the first moment when I saw that, I thought that, well, obviously we have a bug because no orbit looks like that. But uh, after a bit of deliberation, we turned out that no, it actually is looking like that. And the reason for that, uh, I found out later, is they didn't really know the mass of the comet when they were approaching. So in, in order to plot proper courses or orbits around the comet, they had to know the mass of the comet. So they were coming in from the top right and then going in ever closer orbits and you can see that the closer you get, the more circular the orbit becomes. And by measuring this deflection, they could weigh the comet, essentially. So this is actually, by accident, I took a picture of the moment when they were measuring the comet, or weighing it. So that's pretty cool. So as I was saying, doing image projections on a non-convex object is not that easy. But luckily, that, that worked out with uh, Anton's work. And here you can see one of the sequences as the, uh, as the orbiter is flying by. Uh, the size of the orbiter is not correct. That's just for illustration purposes. And you can see it, similar to New Horizons, is taking pictures that are slightly overlapping so you can combine them and stitch them together to get a full, a full map of the comet, essentially. And of course, we had to show the separation of the fillet lander. As you can see here on the right, it docking off. I wanted to, uh, well, I had the code written to render the, the position of fillet on the comet as well, but unfortunately that didn't work out. So uh, I still have to get back to, back to that. And now that we know where it is, we can uh, actually show it. Also, one of the things that you can see is the, uh, another thing that's rarely discussed in the public is how difficult it is to actually land the, <coughs> land the lander on the, on, the, on the comet. So they, I forgot the exact numbers and you have to go back to that, but um, they were releasing it with a speed of I think 25 centimeters per hour. So just a minor variation there meant that they would completely miss the comet. This is one of the reasons why they are taking the pictures post, uh, post release in order to verify, okay, is it actually in the correct location or not? And well, as you can see, the, the location information, uh, which we get from the spice kernels, is getting a bit weird there. As you saw with the um, uh, Himuwari data and the Mars rendering, um, we are supporting planetary mapping. And I think that's probably the aspect of open space which is most, most interesting to the, uh, to the widest audience. So we had a talk an hour ago, I think, uh, from the NOAA people they're, where they're producing data and uh, putting that for free up. So you can basically combine us two and uh, get the data visualized in, uh, in situ in whatever application you want to have. And one of the libraries that we're using for that is called GDAL, the Geospatial Data Abstraction Library layer, one of the two. So it's basically a uh, web interface where you can go out to a web server and query image information. And you tell it which kind of information you want to have from which server and it will just provide images. And then it's up to you to 
map those correctly. As you can see on the bottom, we are doing that well, in open space to, to the correct uh, planets. Again, this is a level of detail algorithm. So you can see the location of the camera in the bottom right and the gray areas, that's the view frustum of the camera. So it's basically what the camera sees. And you can see that all of the areas which are close to the camera, there we're interested in high resolution or the highest resolution that we can get. So you can see that each individual square is getting smaller and smaller the closer it gets to the camera. But on the other hand, if we're far away and like one of those images gets projected to only a small part of the, of the, of the, uh, of the screen, then we can get away with uh, lower resolution. So we don't have to download all of the, in this case, I think six terabytes of Mars data that we have, but well, we can get away with much, much, much less. So we just published, or oh, to any reviewer, we already published. No, it's, uh, we just submitted a paper to IEEE Viz on, on that. Um, and this is one of the videos that we uh, provided with the, uh, uh, with the paper, which shows the same, uh, well, the approach to the, uh, to the sequence that Carter was showing a bit earlier. So here we have uh, uh, Valles Marineres, and we go into the Kandor Kasma on the north, uh, north of it, and then we can uh, show even higher resolution data from that. So here we're switching over to the CTX data, the six meter resolution. Then including the height information and then here we have an, a smaller inset, <coughs> an inset of the high rise uh, images. So neither the CTX nor the high rise is uh, including a, any kind of uh, height information so what they're basically doing is, by now it has finished the uh, 50,000th orbit around. So they are flying over the same uh, areas multiple times. And if, you have, if you're flying over it slightly different, you're taking pictures of it, you have a stereo separation, and then you can reconstruct the height field from that. So this is what, is, what has happened here. This works really well with uh, temporal data as well. In this case, the uh, sea surface temperature and the cloud information that Carter was showing earlier as well. So the only difference between showing the clouds and showing the sea surface temperature is just changing one URL in a configuration file, which is really, really neat. And thus we can uh, show all kinds of different uh, data sets. So all of the things that we saw were color layers and height layers, but we can also show, for example, where the night, uh, where the light where light is emitted on Earth during, from a day-to-day -day basis, for example, or show reference features, uh, show information from OpenStreetMap, for example, or other things. Getting a bit technical again, one of the things that's really difficult with uh, rendering things in space is that everything is so far away, and GPUs really like regular floating point numbers, which it can deal with pretty fast. Um, the problem is that if you're dealing with, very th with things very far away and you still want to see details, the floati floating point precision becomes an issue. So that was one of the, um, another paper that we uh, now got accepted, um, was to develop a meth method for dealing with that. So as you can see, if you wouldn't do anything, this will, would look, let me go back for that. <laughs> this is how it actually would look like. So we have the sun, little egg on the left, we have the Earth and the Moon. So if the Sun is in the center of the coordinate system, everything at Earth, we get a, maybe a couple of centimeters in resolution that we can display. Whereas if we go out to Pluto, basically Pluto becomes a, a pancake that consists of seven slices. So that's not good. So our method was basically to uh, shift everything into the coordinate system of the camera. So you basically treat your camera as the origin of the universe at all times. That way you can get away with uh, high resolution, close your camera. I mean, there's a, there's a theme to that. Basically, the closer you are, the more resolution you want to get. Uh, as the almost last part, just want to get a very quick uh, uh, introduction into how the architecture of the software is actually set up. So as you can see, in here, it's the, the main things that we, uh, that we sell, I mean, that we, that we present as open space. It's the core and our helper library. 
and then a very thin layer of applications on top of that. So everything that's, that non-developers are talking about open space, that's actually the three and a half percent down there, but the rest is just helping it out. And then we have the two, two big modules that are of most interest to uh, external people. So we have the base and the space module. So base is everything that you possibly want to render, and space is everything that you want to possibly render in space. Um, I mean, or derived of that. But then, of course, uh, well, we're using SPICE, the uh, NASA knife library, to um, get the locations of objects. But then, of course, we have all of the external things. So we have uh, everything that you saw with New Horizons, which also includes Rosetta and Osiris Rex, but don't tell anyone. Then there's uh, the globe browsing and a lot of other things that we have uh, developed since. But I think this is just, I mean, like I said, a very high level overview of uh, how the code structure looks like. So then I want to finish with two of the, the brand new things. So I'd ask students to send me over their new, their new shiny stuff that they want to show off. Uh, this is from Jonathan Bosson, uh, who is uh, doing his master thesis at the University of Utah. So he's developing a touch interface for open space. And he prepared a little video for that. Back a bit. So the, well, the idea behind this is to be able to present one of these touch tables into planetariums or museums and let people play around with the data on their own without presenting to them a complicated user interface or uh, like, yeah, just being able to use it as a, um, as a self-determined exploration tool. So you can see that part, a lot of his, uh, re his research was uh, making sure that this look and feel of touch uh, interfaces is there. So for example, you can see that when he touches down his fingers, um, the location where he touches always stays under his finger. That's, it looks very simple, but it's actually quite a difficult problem to do, which uh, yeah, requires some uh, minimalization function and uh, uh, I forgot the name, Lev Marco something, I forgot, sorry. Some uh, optimization function that has to be, uh, has to be solved in real time while it's rendering in order to move the camera so that it actually uh, performs as it should. And that of course then works with how many fingers or how many fingers you want to use. And then another thing is uh, that I'm currently working on with uh, another group at NYU is they're doing real time next to real time measurement of glacial movements in Greenland. So they're getting um, measurements every 10 minutes of glaciers moving into the Atlantic Ocean and how that affects like, of course, global, change, uh, global climate change and well, how these glaciers actually break off and I think later become icebergs, but I haven't asked that yet. So they're basically giving us uh, height information that is time varying. So you can see that in here on the left side, so you can, this is actual now data, so you can see that it's noisy. And now it's moving in time. And actually, if you keep, keep a lookout for the bottom right part, there's a little cliff. And you can see that uh, in maybe 10 seconds or so, that cliff will break off. And uh, so you can see it moving down, and now it's going down. And now the cliff has disappeared. So now a huge part of, of, an, uh, of a glacier has just broken off and will float downstream. And it's their research to better understand how that works. Is there something that we can do against that? Uh, and at the very least, can we predict it so that we can have a better input into well, climate change models? And as I said, this is also very, very new. And uh, I think that's kind of where the, the benefit of open space lies, that it's, it provides a background in order to do these kinds of visualizations relatively easy. So as I was saying with the WMS servers earlier, with the GDAL library and the globe browsing, this again is just geotiffs. So it's just images that I have on the, on the hard disk with, which have information of where they were taken. You point open space to them and the rest is already done and you can look at them in a planetarium. So that's, I think, pretty cool. And with that, 
I would like to finish, and uh, well, if you have any questions, we're very welcome to uh, answer them. Thank you. And of course, if anyone's interested, our URL is up there, or just search for Open Space on GitHub. And there's my contact information as well. If you have any problems compiling anything, which there might, uh, but hopefully not, uh, I'll be able to help with, help with that. Hi, uh, thanks for the talk. Uh, I actually have a question. You mentioned that uh, you have this uh, open source uh, project and uh, you invited everyone to contribute, but it sounds like there's a lot of very serious researchers doing their masters and PhDs in it. Uh, for those of us who don't have background in uh, data visualization uh, and you know just maybe software engineers, uh, how can we contribute with examples if you can? Thank sure. You. So, yes, I mean there's there's a lot of uh, serious research that is going on, but it's my, my task of the project is to coordinate that, that development and merge it into a form so that anyone can use the results of it. So you don't have to understand, for example, how this interaction works without, I mean, you can just use it. So, um, for example, when it comes to, I'll just minimize this and give an actual example. Um, so, for example, with the, uh, with the GDAL, all of the work has already been done. So that, for example, if we want to look at Earth, I mean, we had a talk, a speaker from Esri earlier, so that's kind of convenient. I'm not sure how well, I hope that is visible. But the only real information that you need to put in is this URL up here. So if you have the data in some form, which is not already in open space, but you would like to see that, just writing an XML file is enough to get it in there. And then, I mean, I, this one I've prepared actually. So, for example, up here you have uh, Z, Y, and X. Those are the different coordinates. So, for example, if we do 0, 0, 0, we get this image from, from the server. If we do 0, 0, 1, we get the other part of the Earth. And then if you update the first number, you get lower and lower, in, uh, lower, lower in the, uh, in the tree. But part of, uh, I think, the answer as well, and so far as getting a tutorial on this is that uh, this past fall we had a first hackathon or build-a-thon as Mike Caprio has called it uh, um, to actually and, and broken into two teams so we had team messenger at Mercury and team Cassini uh, out uh, looking at the last Enceladus encounter which was about uh, a year and a half ago and um, so in that uh, these these build-a-thons if you will um, are built around bringing a community here in New York together um, to basically sort of get under the hood on this and, and look at what spice means, look at the things such as Alex is showing you here, so that uh, for those of you who are interested, uh, we hope you can come out in the future. So the video that I'm just showing right now is actually taken from that event. And I think it was 10 people per team about that, and they had about eight hours without any prior experience with open space, and they managed to get this up and running. And I'm actually skipping forward to the interesting parts. So we put in the volumetric information, but then everything that they did uh, was getting the data, understanding how it works, putting it into a format that open space can understand, and then you can see, for example, the, the orbit of Messenger. Going in and out of the magnetosphere for Mercury, which comes quite close to the planet compared to that of Earth. And then also uh, brushing up the models and putting that in. So all of this was done in basically eight hours by very talented people that didn't know anything about the software prior to it. So that was kind of our, our test bed to see how easy is it to just let the, let the software loose on new people and see what they come, out, come, uh, come with it. And the other team, the Cassini people, they almost got this far as well. And they had, they had some other, not their problem technique, uh, not, not their problem problems, so, uh, which pre prevented them from making such a video. But I think it was uh, very successful. And yeah, to circle, take a long circle back to your question, uh, we have to get better, much better at just providing these tutorials online to, so, so that people can just go there and understand, okay, what do I need to do if I want to put this NOAA data combining that with this satellite information. I mean, that, that, that's the information that we have to provide. 
and as I hope this will lead to many people uh, sending me emails asking for things so that I know what to put online. Because that's, that's ma mainly the problem right now. Because I mean, I've been working for this, with this for three years now. I know the ins and outs of it. I don't know what people don't know about it. So that's, I think, which is really useful for anyone, basically, to start using it and trying it out and sending emails. What's your email? Uh, should I really put that on the internet? <laughs> we also had a workshop uh, in Japan at the National Observatory uh, at the beginning of March uh, about data to dome for the planetarium community. And um, we had an open space tutorial and um, actually uh, one of the people from the Japanese NASA called JAXA had uh, the night before put in the mis their mission to Venus. And uh, so this was exciting to see that someone technically minded was able to, and familiar with the spice kernels and all that, which Japan also uses, so does the European Space Agency, but was able to put that mission in. We, we didn't show any visual results of that, but yeah. So there's my email. Uh, send me emails, please. So thank you for the talk. Um, I was wondering if you thought about using the visualized data to build the simulation environment for robots that interact with the environment that aim for space exploration, just to make it specific. Is that something possible? I, w I would say the answer to that would be yes. Uh, for example, the Martian surface you saw very briefly that we're working with uh, NASA uh, in order to drive the rover has to use the stereo cameras to uh, measure the environment uh, three-dimensionally and uh, they do that at every sort of time the rover stops and um, so that that uh, detailed information is then put on something called the planetary data service that NASA operates it's open to the world and uh, so that's what's being visualized uh, the image and the shape um, but uh, having that, it would be a very good question, I think, insofar as, hey, how do we, how would, you know, as an exercise uh, with a rover that you design, you know, let's drive across the surface of Mars. Or, you know, measure something out in the field of, uh, of the desert uh, here on Earth, something like that. Yeah, there's actually a European project going on as well for, I mean, developing a lander for Mars. So they have a test bed in, like in Italy, uh, where they were trying. I mean, they were they were not using our software, but they were developing a, something that was very similar to what we have done. So I certainly ag agree that that's very possible. And with high resolution, I mean, we can we can already put in sub centimeter resolution information. So if you have that information, be it for your for your city. So we're look we're looking at the moment to get in the uh, high resolution models of New York, for example, in in open space. So like. If you have the information, there is no problem to, to make use of that as well. The fine scale models we have for Mars uh, go down to 30 microns per pixel. So my high school students that analyze using something called the NASA Ames Stereo Pipeline developed by NASA Ames Research Center in Silicon Valley uh, uses this uh, stereo uh, algorithm, a photogrammetric technique, and they've created uh, basically a catalog of all the stereo images of these micro details, and it's up to us to then put that into the broader context uh, of the terrains at uh, less resolution, but broader coverage. And that's to take an epicircle back to the, the previous question. It's, again, my task, we develop that for Mars, but then develop it in such a way that anyone can just use it on any planet in any location. So, yes. Thank you very much.